Good afternoon and welcome to another Wellness Connection of Maine webinar. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Becky DeCoyster. I'm the education liaison here and today we're going to be talking about medical marijuana or cannabis and cancer. And we have a very, very special guest. Uh, Molly Stewart is joining us. Molly is the Mission Services Director at the Cancer Community Center. And uh, hi, Molly. Thank you for, for joining us. And uh, Molly and I are sitting here uh, with producer Ben, who is making sure that um, all of the technological tricks and, and traps go the way they're supposed to. So um, he's waving at you right now. So hi, producer Ben. <laughs> so um, if you have not joined us before, these uh, webinars are um, part of our educational outreach series, and you will be able to find them uh, on our website, if you have to miss one, you can always check in uh, the evening or the next day after we put them on uh, and find them posted on our website. Um, and without further ado, because we want to be sensitive to everybody's time, um, Molly, Mission Services Director at the Cancer Community Center. Can you tell me a little bit about um, what the Cancer Community Center is, where is it, um, and what kind of work you do there? So the Cancer Community Center is an independent nonprofit. And we provide support services for people whose lives have been disrupted by cancer. And we provide a variety of support services from wellness and movement activities to complementary therapies, a variety of support groups, as well as learning opportunities and creative expression opportunities. And my role at the center is to oversee and help guide and direct all of our services, making sure that we're meeting the needs of the community. Wow, wow. A um, couple of uh, clarifications. So, so first of all, how much does it cost to become a member? You know, we are able to provide all the services we do at no cost to any of our community members, thanks wow. to the generosity of the community. That is amazing. So the user completely free services. And, and uh, are they directed only at the person who might have cancer, or, or are there supports for family members, things like that? That is a great question, Becky. <laughs> and we provide anybody whose life has been disrupted by cancer, so that um, people in active treatment, people who are in survivorship, as well as their friends and families and their caregivers, um, mm. because everybody needs a little extra support when your life um, gets disruptive in that manner. Absolutely. It's a, it's a scary time. Um, what, well, where are you? Can you give us your address? And we'll repeat this again at the end if folks don't have a pen or something. So we are tucked away on Route 1 right across the border in South Portland. Mm -hmm. So we're at 778 Main Street in South Portland, on the corner of Wallace Avenue. And we're on the second floor. We're a little hidden gem in South Portland. <laughs> we really are. I, I have to say, having visited the uh, the center, um, it, you know, it's it's kind of tucked away, but man, it's so welcoming when you walk in, and the folks there are just always so uh, friendly. <laughs> yeah, it's really an amazing friendly. community. It's an amazing community, and I think what's surprising to a lot of people is that there's a lot of joy. Mm -hmm. That happens there every day. It's not a sad, depressing place. It's a very joyful and hopeful place. You are right. I, yes. I, <laughs> it's not uncommon to hear laughter <laughs> echoing from one or another of the rooms as you, as you go in. Um, fantastic. How long have you been doing this work with the Cancer Community Center? I've been with the center over two years, mm -hmm. and it has been an incredible opportunity and a great it's just a pretty great place to be every day. So. <laughs> to be surrounded by awesome people, that's, yeah, a, that's a good absolutely. thing. Um, what were you doing before? So I, I have worked in social work for over 15 years, wow. believe it or not. And I've done a variety of things um, within the social work field, all of them relatively community-based. And so I found myself finishing my MSW program as an intern at the center and then ah. went away for a year and then found out there was an opening and, and came back. Awesome. So. Awesome. Well, they are lucky to have you and, and we as a community are lucky to have uh, the center, um, you know, serving people and, and doing the good work that you do. So um, as part of your work, you get to talk to a lot of Mainers who, who are dealing with cancer um, and their family members and friends. Um, and I took the liberty of checking out the Maine 
cancer surveillance report from 2014, and I guess they do these every year. Is that or every couple of years? Every mm-hmm. couple of years. This is the most recent report. Okay. Okay. Um, and it's a it's a fantastic uh, and very detailed document. Um, there's some really interesting data in there, and, and if we had more time, we can go into all of it. Um, but I, I took some of the top level stuff for for us to talk about. Um, that that first stat really kind of surprised me that 34% of all main deaths are are related to cancer. Absolutely. That's, that's astonishing. Yeah. Um yeah, it's the, you know, it's the leading cause of death in our state, which is why there's, you know, I think in in our field there's a lot of conversation going on about that. How can we reduce reduce the rate of deaths from cancer in the state? Right, right. And we're one of only a few states where that that is the case. Where it is the, the leading cause. Are we, are we the state with the most deaths from cancer by population? Do you know? Or? Not off the top of my head. Okay, but we're up there. We are. So it's, it's definitely. Uh, and, and in this report, if you, if you look at the bottom of the screen here, uh, there's the, the, you know, the words to Google if you want to go and look at this report yourself and download it. Um, they do provide maps of cancer incidents by county and everything. And it does, I mean, obviously Portland is a population center and hub, so, so there are higher levels there. But also uh, it seemed like Washington and Piscataquis County both had, you know, higher than, definitely higher than the national average and, and high even for Maine. Yeah. Uh, you know, in terms of, of what was what was going on there. Um, so the, what you're seeing in this graph um, is, you know, comparing Maine to data from the across the nation. Um, the National Cancer Institute uh, runs this program, and you see that that acronym there, SEER, that stands for Surveillance Epidemiology and End Results Program. And so the National Cancer Institute's um, monitors the in, in, instance, the rates of cancer across the nation, and then the main report here is is comparing our rates um, with both the the total national average and then the national average for Caucasians in the U.S. and and that's not a <laughs> you, you don't want to beat that line you don't want to be <laughs> you know, the, the winner in that in that contest. Have, do you have any insight into why Maine has such a high rate of cancer? I think that's a question that a lot of people are asking. Mm-hmm. And I think it's it's similar to the um, looking for the cure for cancer, that there's there's no one answer mm. is what we're finding. Yeah, There's no one answer, but some of the statistics that we do know are that I think it's 40% of cancer diagnoses are preventable through lifestyle changes, mm. modifications. Mm-hmm. So I think that's that's definitely something to consider. And also we have to keep in mind that um, we are in a state that's aging pretty rapidly. And right. So there's a higher incidence. And, um, yeah, and, and actually that's a great segue to, to one of the slides that's coming up where we, we're going to look at the ages. So. Um, this next chart looks at, uh, before we get into age, we're going to talk about gender. Um, and I found this kind of interesting, that, that males had a significant, statistically significantly higher incidence and death rates from cancer than females did, and that those same rates for males are declining faster than the women's rates are going down. And I, I don't know if, it, you know, if you had any thoughts on that, Molly, or if... <laughs> you know, I don't know. I, that was interesting. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've read this report before, but I hadn't spent a, a whole lot of time with that particular information. Yeah. Um, you know, I, as I mentioned to you before, we know that um, women are getting diagnosed with lung cancer and dying from lung cancer at a faster rate than men. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think also when we consider the types of cancers um, that are more commonly uh, associated between the sex, then mm. you're looking at um, some differences there as well. But no, I'm not sure. Yeah. And we see, you know, we serve, we serve a variety of folks, but we definitely significantly serve more women. Mm. And we know that support services, you know, although they're, there are definitely some gaps in the state where there aren't support services. Support services can be helpful for people as far as um, talking to other people who have had a similar experience, mm-hmm. helping navigate paths, hearing about different treatments. Right. Um, but yeah. yeah. I'm not sure why, 
why males have a significantly higher incidence in death rate than females. I would imagine that there are scientists trying to figure that out, <laughs> probably yeah. as we speak, for sure. Um, that's interesting that you mentioned that you're, you're, you know, the folks who make use of the center. Um, do you have a percentage? Do you know what percent are female versus male? The last time I looked at it, I believe we have close to... It's probably 85% female. Wow, wow. Yeah, that surprises it's me. It's a pretty steep um, yeah. female ratio. Mm -hmm. yeah, and then I, I we, do, we do see a, a fair number of men, too. Um, drawn to specific classes, believe it or not, we see higher rates of men in support groups, mm. um, particularly, um, uh, you know, support groups that specifically support men, like prostate cancer support group, mm -hmm. um, but also men engaging in services like our complementary therapies and Tai Chi, things like that. Yeah. But they seem to be less likely to come into creative expression activities. So. <laughs> I think we, we see a similar pattern. Our, our ratio is, um, I think, across our four dispensaries, I want to say we're closer to like 60, 40, and possibly even even more, um, and I'm sorry, that's 60% male um, to 40% female. Um, the numbers of, of women that we see are growing, um, but it's it's just interesting that maybe there's a gap there or something about huh. the the cultural acceptability of a, a man going to seek help versus a, a, a woman, or I, I don't know. I, I, I'm thinking about our support groups that we've done together there at the center, and there's always been male representation with, like, I think one exception. Yep. There was a, you know, yeah, so. mixed yeah. support groups. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move on. And, and Molly mentioned, um, you know, breaking out the different types of cancer. This does the, uh, that function um, and then also looks at those types of cancer by age groups. Um, and you can definitely, I mean, prostate cancer does peak there in the 65 to 74 age group. Um, but, but there's, uh, you know, the, the, as you age, the prevalence goes up and I, that's true in Maine or any other state as well. So, um, and then the next slide goes into the bladder cancer, breast, cervical, and colorectal. Um, again, if you go to, you know, if you download that document, again, you can Google Maine Cancer Surveillance Report 2014 um, and download that, that PDF. There, there is a wealth of information in it, um, including, as we said, maps and, and specific chapters on each of the types of cancer that they, that they focused on. Um, Molly, at the Cancer Community Center, do you track or have any way of knowing what types of, of cancers the people you serve are living with? We have recently started tracking, so we'll have a much better idea at the end of next year, maybe when we do this next October. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but we know we see a significantly high percentage of women, mm -hmm. so we do serve a, a number of women, a lot of women with breast cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and we also know that lung cancer is extremely prevalent in this state yes. and we serve a number of folks with lung cancer. We also serve a number of cancers that, you know, that aren't listed on here, things like multiple myeloma and leukemia, lymphomas, things like that. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a pretty wide variety and then also all their caregivers mm -hmm. as well. Right, right. So whether that's family or friend. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a number of different types of cancer that are sort of lumped into that tobacco related cancer category as well. Right, right. So and they and so they, they separate out lung cancer and then there are still other what throat cancers, throat, mouth esophagus. Yeah. Yeah, anything thoracic and actually bladder cancer can be tobacco related as well. Oh really? I did yeah. not know that. Another good name? reason to yeah. put down the uh, the tobacco cigarettes I'd say. Wow. Okay, so let's um, let's take a look. I, I briefly touched on the fact that um, Molly and I co-facilitate a support group for um, Cancer Community Center clients who are interested in learning more about medical marijuana. Um, and so uh, I have to say that that um, Molly is is extremely knowledgeable about that that topic as well, and it's one of the reasons why I asked her to join us today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the science. Um, before we get into that, Molly, can you talk? Okay, so, so medical marijuana has been legal in Maine since 99. Now, we didn't have a very um, 
you know, strict regulatory structure until about 2009. Had you noticed a change in your work with the center or even in your social work life before that um, in the number of folks who are asking questions about this stuff? Are people more open about it now? Or? It's, it's interesting. So we facilitated the medical cannabis discussion group for probably about a year, and we had a wide range of interest and then medical cannabis is is a resource for people affected mm -hmm. by cancer. And so when we meet individually with people, we talk about different resources that are available. And we talk to people about the issues they're having that are related to cancer. Things like, I can't sleep. Mm -hmm. Or, my taste buds have completely changed. I have no appetite. Or, I'm in so much pain and, you know... I don't want to take medication or I don't want to take any more medication. So there's a lot of trends, you know, that come up um, for people. And when we, when we talk about the different resources out there, we do talk about medical cannabis. And sometimes people bring it up mm -hmm. and sometimes we bring it up. But the majority of people I have found are, are open to, to learning a little bit more and are really open to anything that's going to help to relieve some mm, of the, the, um, symptoms. Some of the symptoms, some of the yeah. challenges that come with managing a cancer diagnosis. Yeah. Um, that being said, it is an interesting, um, it is interesting because it will, like we saw before, the majority of people being diagnosed with cancer are 65 and older. Mm -hmm. So the rhetoric that um, the baby boomers heard growing up, is coming into contrast with a lot of the <laughs> growing evidence for medical cannabis. Mm -hmm. um, so, and there's there's a challenge there that people face and how they how they approach utilizing if they approach utilizing medical cannabis. Absolutely, absolutely, and and yeah, I mean if you've grown up with that mindset, um, you know, with, with some of those stereotypes, it it can be very difficult <laughs> to to say, okay, you know, my back's against the wall. Maybe maybe this is worth a shot. So um, I do think that knowing some of the science um, helps, and I find that when I'm presenting to um, you know the elder um, population, um, the, the, many of them I think take some comfort in in being able to point to a study or you know um, here, here's what the National Cancer Institute has to say um, and actually this comes right from their site um, they, they have in the last couple of years started to really be much more open about the potential of cannabinoid medicine now they're not you know on their website saying grow your own plants these are um, you know preclinical studies and they're very cautious to, to avoid saying things like it's going to cure cancer or anything but um, the National Cancer Institute's uh, have have done reviews, you know, they've done meta-analysis, they've done studies, uh, funded studies themselves, and on their website, they they say at this point uh, that preclinical studies, so that's not in humans yet, um, indicate potential for anti-tumor activity, uh, for stimulating appetite, and we know that that's such a, a bugbear in in cancer treatment um, and the side effects of, of the more traditional treatments. Um, we've got clinical evidence that it is an analgesic and provides pain relief, that it helps with nausea and vomiting. And actually, that was one of the first um, modern or contemporary uh, accepted uses of, of medical cannabis was for nausea and vomiting in HIV-AIDS patients. Uh -huh. Yeah, back in the day. So... Um, and it's referenced in all of the ancient pharmacopoeias. We have known that cannabis prevented nausea and vomiting for thousands of years, but the science is now finally getting around to, to proving it. Um, and then also that it helps with anxiety and sleep. Um, I was just reading a study this morning um, that, that looked at cannabis and sleep and, and found that for a regular or heavy user, it may actually um, interfere with with some stages of sleep, with restful sleep, yep. um, but that for an intermittent or a moderate user, um, it is actually um, a help. So what you're looking at here um, is a, a slide uh, from the Pacific Medical Center, and on the left you see the, um, the breast cancer cells. They're those long sort of, I don't know, worm or 
icky looking things. And then on the right, they have um, applied pure CBD to those cells and, and seen them, um, basically they call it cell suicide. The word is apoptosis. So this, this is information that even our federal government is having to, <laughs> having to, to admit, you know, this is, this is it. Um, this is what we're seeing. And, and so for, for, as we were talking about, as, as, as a patient who, you know, doesn't just want to or has not grown up feeling comfortable around cannabis, I think knowing these sorts of things is, is very helpful. And I've got the, uh, the site listed on the slide for you right there. Um, I do want to touch a little bit for our listeners on how, how do, you know, how does the plant help? Um, and, and I think it's best to start by, by introducing the endocannabinoid system, which is a system of receptors that are found on cell surfaces throughout our body. Um, the, these are like little locks and, and the active compounds in the cannabis plant fit into them like a key. Um, and they are, as you see on the diagram here, they are abundant in our bodies, certainly in our brain. They're the most abundant neurotransmitter receptor in our brains. Um, yeah, <laughs> but also uh, the digestive tract, um, the liver, uh, they are vital in our um, oh, immune function. Um, so they, 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 it's a, it's a, a pretty wide-ranging network of receptors. Um, and it seems that wherever they appear in the body, their purpose, when, when those receptors get activated by, by using natural plant cannabis or by our bodies producing similar compounds um, themselves, uh, the purpose tends to be homeostasis. So it, it, it's creating a sense of balance. Um, one of the things that we hear, Molly, and I don't know if you hear this, but um, is, well, you know, how can it be good for everything? You know? yeah. <laughs> how, can, how can one plant be so good for everything? Well, it's because it's, it's sort of manipulating the body's thermostat to, to create balance, to reduce inflammation, um, to provide, you know, energy and kind of a boost to the mitochondria in our cells. Um, so there's, there's a great deal going on. Um, yeah, you mentioned the interaction with the immune system. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, when we're talking about people affected by cancer, you, you think a lot more about your immune system every day mm -hmm. and the importance of that. And yeah, could you talk a little bit about how, how <laughs> cannabis <laughs> supports the immune system? How does that work? Absolutely. Um, well, we, and I don't have a slide on this, but um, I, I can give you a, a resource for our listeners to, to um, get further information. Basically, one of the ways is that um, the, the interaction of these receptors um, actively encourages the mitochondria in our cells, which are, it's kind of like the engine of your cell. It's like a little powerhouse. Um, and and it, it helps them function better. Um, it, um, it has antioxidant properties. It, wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're, and they're finding all this in the lab. So, um, yeah, it, it stimulates um, the immune response. Now, it's interesting, as we're going to see on the next slide, I think, these are just some of the active compounds in the plant and what, again, the science is saying they each do. If you look at that large yellow section um, that says CBD, about halfway down, not quite halfway down, it says reduces function in the immune system. And so that's kind of counterintuitive. Um, but what happens when, what, well, what they see happen when they're applying that particular molecule um, to, in, in this case, lab animals, um, is that it is, it is not um, decreasing healthy immune function. It is um, preventing sort of autoimmune um, problems that come with, like, rheumatoid arthritis. Interesting. Okay. So when the body starts seeing itself as the enemy, yep. cannabis is there helping the, the white blood cells to, you know, know when to lay off actually yep. exactly um and, and so so when yeah so when we're when we're using cannabis we're we're ingesting all of those compounds and many many more i want to be clear about that um and they all live in those pretty resin glands that you see on the surface of the, the plant there um 
do you have do you have members come to you asking like what kind of questions do you get, Molly? And again, if you're just joining us, um, we're talking with Molly Stewart, who is the Mission Services Director at the Cancer Community Center in South Portland. Um, so yeah, Molly, what kind of questions do people ask? People have a lot of questions. I think the majority of questions. You know, sometimes people have gone online and done some research themselves, and there's mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of information out there. A lot of it, um, some is helpful, some is not so helpful. Mm -hmm. So people get into that information, and then I think a lot of the other questions we get are, well, how how do I get started? Where uh, do I get started? What does that look like? Right. Um, and it's the, really the process of getting that medical cannabis card. And yeah. then, and then once they have the card, <laughs> then what? No, what? <laughs> then it opens up a whole other. Well, what what type should I use, and when should I use it, and how much should I use it? Right. And so they're not, you know, they often. You know, they can't go to the pharmacist and say, hey, <laughs> take one every two hours. Exactly. Um, so it's much more of that, what works for you. Mm -hmm. and, and it's based on that endocannabinoid system. You know, yeah. how many receptors are in your body, what's going to work best for you is yeah. only going to work best for you. Right. Um, and you might not find it, you know, first bat out of the box, too. That's, you know, something that we try and remind people as well. Absolutely. I think people need, I mean, that's one of the reasons why we've offered some help navigating um, people's, people want access and they want more information about medical cannabis, um, but they needed this intermediary to mm -hmm. someone, someplace that they could go to say, okay, I have cancer and I'm interested in medical cannabis and I'm lost. <laughs> right. It's a huge system. So many help. <laughs> what do I need to know? <laughs> um, well, we are going to be talking about that process um, in just a moment. Before we move on, um, I want to go, well, I, we can stay on this slide, but if you're if you're curious about what the science is saying um, about cannabis or cannabinoids, which are these active compounds and cancers of various types, um, a great resource is PubMed. www.pub as in boy, med as in Daniel. Dot com or org, either one works, uh, and that is the the federal government's clearinghouse of research. Um, and we'll, we'll uh, repeat that address uh, towards the end of our presentation as well. So the, the science, the National Cancer Institute is saying that, okay, there, there is potential anti-tumor activity. It's, you know, these cannabinoids are doing good things to help some of the most common symptoms uh, that come along with traditional cancer treatments. Um, and I just wanted to kind of focus on that. So, so there's your, your endocannabinoid system throughout your body. Its job is to balance you out, provide homeostasis. Um, and, and there are many, many of these uh, receptors in the, the hypothalamus, which is sort of actually your brain's thermostat. I think I used that, that analogy before, and it's very apt. Um, it's a part of your brain that is controlling a number of different systems, your endocrine system, um, you know, the release of various hormones, your digestive tract, your, your all kinds of stuff is being sort of managed from that central processing center in our brains. Um, on the left there, you see that there's two types of cannabis or cannabinoid receptors in your bodies that we've identified so far. They think there might be a third type. Um, and they think that because the THC molecule fits very neatly, lock and key, into CB1 receptors. And the CBN receptor or molecule, uh, which, by the way, is one of the ones that helps with sleep specifically, they found it. Uh, CBN fits very neatly into the CB2 receptor, and, and you can go through the list of active molecules and see which receptors they fit into, except CBD doesn't fit directly into either one. Interesting. Yeah, and, and if you go back to that previous slide, I mean, look at it, it's doing all of that stuff. It's sitting in somewhere. <laughs> exactly. So we know that CBD has uh, plays a big role in um, toning down or moderating the effect of THC. And and so the THC molecule, oh, I lost my cursor, but up in the upper right quadrant there, um, that is the V1 psychoactive component of the plant. And so this is one of the questions we get asked a lot. 
I I don't want to get high, <laughs> you know. <laughs> right. I'm, you know, I might be 65, 70 years old managing a cancer diagnosis. The last thing I want is a psychoactive effect. Exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> how do I use cannabis without that effect? <laughs> <laughs> and and um, I know that the staff there are, are very knowledgeable about this stuff now. Um, and and the good news is that they don't you don't have to get high anymore. Um, you know we we have bred strains of cannabis that, that have much higher levels of CBD than they do THC. Um, and the lab science at this point is getting us to a place where we can um, pull out all of these active compounds and kind of sort them and recombine them in the ratios that we want. So um, for our hospice patients and for, I know, many of our our older patients, because when they, when they say that to you, when they come to us, they say the same thing. You know, I don't want to get high. <laughs> you know, I have to take care of my grandkids Absolutely. or whatever. Um, they really, many of them uh, find that the one-to-one CBD to THC ratio is is helpful. You know, functional, but but not um, you know, that high feeling. Yeah. That, you know, too euphoric. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and I think, um, I, and I don't know if you ever hear this on your side, Molly, but, um, you know, when, when we are looking at what strains of cannabis to, to provide to patients, um, we look at a number of things. And, and I have to say that in part due to extensive prohibition, there's some really funny cannabis names out there. <laughs> you know, it's like it's like rose rose varietals or grape varietals, but you know, instead you have train wreck. <laughs> yeah. This is my medicinal train wreck. Oh my. Um, and and I think that as the science develops, we're going to move um, move away. I mean, I don't think strain nomenclature is going to change significantly, but I do think that that people are going to start coming in and saying, I don't care what you call it. I want one to one you know, CBD to THC ratio or five to one or, you know, much more specific in that way. Yeah, absolutely. And is that, you know, I think one of the ways that we talk about it with people is we talk about the two larger, you know, the groupings, the indicas and the sativas Mm -hmm. and sort of their, you know, what you're looking for um, will most likely we be CBD in, in an indica. Yeah, exactly. um, So that folks know sort of some of the questions to ask, um, whoever they're whether, working with. Right, whether they get to a caregiver or a, yeah. a dispensary, yeah. Yeah, I do, I mean, you know, Indica and Sativa are, are, have been very useful, you know, shorthands. And, and yes, for most people, a, a strong Indica will be relaxing and sedative and, a, a, you know, a genetically strong Sativa is going to be more energizing and, and focused. But I really think in the next five years, we're going to be talking a whole lot more about potency and, and cannabinoid content than, yeah. you know, Durban poison, which, <laughs> you know, oh, there are some amazing names, yes. <laughs> so, um, so, okay, so I, um, all this by way of saying, let's get back to our endocannabinoid system, um, in terms of, you know, what are the cancer symptoms, and, and not just of the, the cancer, I think, but maybe now you can talk a little bit about the treatments yeah, and and the issues that they cause. Mm-hmm. So you know, so traditional cancer treatments can encompass, I mean, three general categories with another growing rapidly. Mm-hmm. Um, a variety of chemotherapy treatments. And chemotherapy, I mean, I think everybody's pretty familiar with that and some of the side effects of mm-hmm. that. And different chemotherapies have very different side effects. I think people think, oh, I'm going to lose my hair if I have chemotherapy. Well, that's not necessarily true for a variety of chemotherapies, Mm. Um, but nausea and vomiting, certainly things like that are pretty common. Mm -hmm. Um, Loss of appetite or change in appetite, which can mean, you know, a change in taste. Um, Sometimes things taste very metallic. Mm. Um, So managing, managing things like that. And then radiation. With radiation, you can be left with some some pain complications, mm-hmm. um, and then some, some eating challenges depending on um, what part of your body you had radiation. And then surgery as well. I mean, and surgery can also leave you um, with, mm. with some lasting pain oh, yeah. and yeah. managing that pain. Um, and then there is also the growing um, 
target therapies, which is a lot of the immunotherapy you're mm. hearing about. Mm-hmm. And that's a really a growing category um, for cancer treatment that we'll, we'll see continue to grow. Really? Um, yeah. Does it, does, it, does it produce these negative side effects? Is that... And my understanding is that there are fewer negative side effects wow. with immunotherapies. That's fantastic. I was at a conference where they were talking about um, gene sequencing and, and the promise of that and the limitations of it for, for identifying and treating not just cancer but other diseases. So um, fascinating stuff. Uh, before we get to you know any of the, <laughs> um, the the wonders of science, the wonders of this plant <laughs> with, with uh, the cannabinoids that the cannabis plant contains um, via the endocannabinoid system, uh, people can find relief from from each of these things. And actually, I think depression is maybe overlooked sometimes, but man, it's, it's hard to, yeah. you know, live with the diagnosis and the treatments and the, yeah. So, so we have evidence of um, support via your endocannabinoid system for all of these uh, areas that, you know, that chemo brain and fatigue and forgetting things. Um, there are actually strains and, and specific cannabinoids that kind of help sharpen focus um, and, and, you know, appetite is again widely known. Fever and chills. Where does what does that? I mean, is is that associated with no, one type of cancer treatment more than another? Or? You know, not that I know of, but mm. that's definitely something. I mean, when you're talking about um, going through a cancer treatment, you often end up with a lower immune system, mm. and so then you're exposed to all the germs right. that are out there. Right. Right. Well, and it goes back to that. That balance, you, you know, the homeostasis, your temperature, you're, you're shooting radiation at the body, you're, you're running chemicals through the body. Yeah, absolutely. And it really does disrupt the, the natural balance. And I think fatigue is mm. something that can plague people, particularly people who have experienced either chemotherapy or radiation, sometimes for a long time post-treatment. Mm, really? Um, so it's definitely something that bothers folks. But chemo brain, you know, that... That sort of goes against, I think, the common association with cannabis Mm -hmm. having, um, you know, effects of short-term memory. Right. (laughs) So, (laughs) yeah. Well, and and folks often are surprised to to find that there are strains. Some of them, if you're if if you are identifying by the the type of you know family tree um, that the plant comes from, the sativas strains tend again to provide more focus and more energy um, that is related to um, THC and, and some of the other um, individual, well I'm not going to go all the way back, <laughs> we don't want to make you go through all that, um, but there are some of the individual cannabinoids that we are identifying that, that actually can help um, combat that. So. All right, so one more look at some very promising cannabinoid research. Um, these are all, and I'm sure this is not a complete list, but you know, there, there have been preclinical lab studies um, showing the potential of cannabinoids in each of these types of cancer. So. No preclinical studies. <laughs> the process of going through. A clinical trial mm-hmm. and that whole process that's a very long process in the United States as I understand it it is it's 10 to 12 years for drug uh, drug development you know to, to start from the idea and then come out the other end as a pill <laughs> yeah and when you're working with cannabinoids um, because you know marijuana is a federal 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 schedule one substance um, you have extra hurdles that add to the, the process. Um, so we could expect to see human studies in the endocannabinoid system and cannabis. And we could expect to see them in Israel. I mean, no, I think in, in the U.S. Um, I think a lot is going to depend on how this election goes. Um, I think that, that the more states, um, and I'm not just talking about legalization, although I think that does advance the, the whole conversation. Um, but we are looking at maybe having our first southern state become a medical marijuana state, Florida. Okay. And so you want to talk about, you know, um, well, demographics. That's another older state. Um, 
and I, I think that these things eventually the federal government is going to just have to see that <laughs> you know they, they've lost this one. You know the people have, are smarter than they are. Um, there is uh, one study that is getting underway um, using human subjects in I want to say at the University of Arizona. The doctor who is leading it is named Sue Sisley, S I S L E Y, uh, and she is doing a study on post-traumatic stress in veterans and and cannabis use. So that. But, I mean, that process, I think they've been 10 years tr just trying to get the government to approve that. So, and then finding a university that would house yeah. the research. So it's, it's very complex. It's, it's very frustrating. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and it's important to note that, you know, I, I think a lot of people know, know someone who has been helped by using marijuana, right? It helped their appetite, it helped whatever. Um, when you're talking to a scientist, that's anecdotal evidence, and it doesn't mean literally, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, it's super frustrating. Yeah. Um, Qualitative reports, not quantitative. Exactly, right. exactly. Yeah. So they want they want numbers. They want you know repeatable results. Yep. Um, and with the plants, you know, you and I could could consume the exact same you know five milligram edible and have very different responses to it. So it, it's a it's a it's a tricky subject to fit a plant into our our, our contemporary medical um, schema, I guess. Uh, there at the bottom of this slide, you'll see that PubMed.com uh, website again and again. That's a great resource, very easy to use. You can just go on there and type in the search bar cannabis and you know. You can just car somewhere and, and see what might come up. A lot of the positive studies, um, I wasn't kidding about Israel, they, they do come from overseas places with different ideas about, <laughs> about cannabis uh, where it is easier to do, um, to even obtain the plant to work with in the lab, let alone with humans. So, um, but yeah, a lot, of, a lot of good potential. So. And it is important to remember as we've been mentioning, that these two things are not the same. You know, using using the plant um, versus testing an individual cannabinoid in the lab um, are very, very different things. So. <laughs> All right. Methods of administration. Um, I think for those who have, have been through WCM's process, this is going to be a little bit of a review. Um, do you get any sense, Molly, of, of what, like if, if somebody comes to you and you're going through your talk about what are the resources that are available to help you, um, and we hit on marijuana, do, do folks immediately think of smoking? Are people aware that there are other options? How do you feel about that? Yeah, I think people initially think it's only available for um, inhalation and you know, then we have a further conversation about the, you know, the methods of use and how it can be very diverse. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the majority of people, the people who are interested and who are actively looking um, for this have done some of the research and mm. get a real sense of what they're looking for. Right. And then there are people who are working their way through figuring out how to use medical cannabis and it can be a combination of a number of these things that work well for them. Right. Um, and I mean, we have uh, the cooking with cannabis class I'm coming up on November 9th. Super excited. <laughs> where, where we talk about how, how do you cook with cannabis and what does that look like? Um, right. So it's it's all about figuring out what works what works for each person. Mm -hmm. And it really is pretty individual. Well, and setting expectations too. Absolutely. But, you know, the first thing we try might not be the thing. It might. It might be great. But it might not do the trick. And we'll have to, you know, try something else. And, and if, you know, this edible doesn't, doesn't work for you or, or you know, there, there are many, many options. We can yeah. always. And it's best what you guys tell people to start slow. <laughs> yes. Start low and go slow. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> I think that's good yeah. advice. It's good advice for people to um, mm. be very aware of that, that it is very individual and that it right. takes some work to the figure out what, dial in what works. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so again, because this is sort of a, a, a review, I think that, you know, folks, folks kind of understand this. I do want to point out topicals. Um, Molly, you were mentioning 
radiation. Mm -hmm. And my dad went through that, and I remember the the burning and the pain, and and salves like that can be so very helpful for things like that. So, and and non psychoactive. So for people who are concerned about that, yeah, <laughs> you know, definite benefit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've known a lot of people who have gotten some um, some good relief from topicals. Yeah, yeah. All right. I, I know we both get questions about this. <laughs> we get this. a lot of questions about this. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's talk a little bit um, about cannabis oil. And I think that this got, I, well, it got some media attention when Sanjay Gupta put out his first special called Weed and focused on this stuff helping some children with very severe forms of epilepsy. Um, but, yeah, you might hear it called Rick Simpson Oil, for extract cannabis oil or FICO or Phoenix Tears. I hadn't heard that one before. FICO or Phoenix Tears? Phoenix Tears. Phoenix Tears, yeah. yeah. Um, these are all referring to generally the same thing, and I, and I wanted to just kind of clarify. Um, there are folks out there who will say that they have, and, and who believe um, that they cured their cancers using these cannabis oils. Um, I know, I know that we don't, you know, that's not a claim that I would make about any of our products, that this will cure pretty much anything. It will, it will definitely help, <laughs> but, um, so that's, I, you know, I can't personally cross that line. Um, but I just, I do want to be clear that, you know, it, there, there are two options. They're very similar. You see the pictures down at the bottom. On the left-hand side, we have tincture, and I was talking about that being a really nice entry-level um, product for for somebody who's what cannabis naive or maybe the last time they used it was in 1972 <laughs> yeah it seems to be a more manageable way you know you can really control the amount you're using um yeah yeah and and you know it's not maybe a half a dropper full is is enough for you etc so but it, it is you know tinctures are edibles um, the base is usually well back in you know the early 1900s it was alcohol uh, many people still use that. Um, also, glycerin, we use hemp seed oil. Basically, what you're doing is you're dropping the flour into this liquid and letting it infuse into that liquid and then straining the leaf parts out, um, and away you go. Uh, with a tincture, you might have a ratio like you see there, an ounce of flour. You might, you know, for a nice mild tincture, you can get a fluid ounce bottle of, of tincture out of that. Um, and it is, it's measured in, in drops or even a dropper full. So, um, on the oil side, and I don't know, have you, have you ever seen this product? I, I or have has not, any, okay. but you know, it's in, in looking at this, you know, one of the things when you're diagnosed with cancer, you immediately start, a lot of people immediately start looking at what, um, what's in a lot of the products that I'm using mm. and, and this, it's, it's true for cannabis you know people want to make sure that it's mm -hmm. um that pesticides aren't being used that mm -hmm. you know in things like this that there aren't i mean other solvents um, <laughs> you know, yes. what does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> um and that is a, a very good point um i want to be clear that no matter what the solvent used you know a, a good processor should be able to off gas and, and you know pr provide a very clean product um if you're oil tastes or, well, let's say if your oil smells like butane, that's not clean product. <laughs> you know? um, but again, these are, these are edible, um, you know, liquids, but very thick. Um, people use, again, alcohol. Uh, CO2 is a, is a clean process that produces a different color um, liquid um, than, than what you see here. Uh, butane and other solvents that naphtha comes to mind. That was Rick Simpson um, up in Nova Scotia sort of was the, the godfather of this oil. Um, and he began by using naphtha as the solvent to strip the, the resin off of the plant. So um, in terms of potency, you know, you see the difference there. An ounce of flour yields two to four grams of oil. And, uh, you know, for, for people who, who are trying, let's say, to cure, you know, to reduce tumor size, um, they may go through, you know, a gram a day. Some of the dosing is, is or more. Some of the dosing 
protocols um, that are sort of anecdotally recommended are, are you know, are, are pretty steep. Um, so it's extremely potent, um, and you don't get a whole lot. You're packing an ounce into into a tiny, tiny amount. Uh, and the dosing, again, is measured in, you know, grains of rice, literally. Rub it on your gums and, <laughs> you know. Um, so that is that is the comparison. You can make either one at home um, safely, even, you know, I, Certainly, you don't you don't need to be using butane, um, <laughs> but if you do, there's, there are safe ways to do it as well. Um, this is one of the places where, as a as an industry, it's frustrating for for me at least, and I don't know how, that, what you hear from the patients, but um, that that there, are, I think we've been very lucky that that at least so far in Maine. We haven't seen some of the headlines that we see out. Well, we have, we have seen out in Colorado of people, you know, blowing themselves up trying to produce these things. So oh, I have not seen those headlines. Yeah, yeah. Headlines. So I, you know, it, 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 these are processes that belong in a, a, a safe, certified lab. <laughs> you know, and, and yes. for the most part, not in not in the garage. But again, it can be done safely. Uh, so if if you're, you know. If, if you're if you're hearing about Rick Simpson oil, or if you have a diagnosis and you're in that stage of, you know, what can I learn? What can I find? You're going to probably run across this. That's what they're that's what they're talking about. Let's talk side effects. <laughs> um, you know, Molly, do you, do you have you know when when folks come to you, is this something that they're worried about? I mean, aside from feeling high, the euphoria. Um, I think the they... one that comes up the most, um, that dry mouth, mm. because that's already, can already be a side effect, uh -huh. so it can exacerbate okay. um, some issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I think folks are dealing with a lot of other side effects from, from a lot of other treatments and a lot of other medications. Right. So comparatively, um, these are much more manageable side effects. Right. Um, and then always encouraging people, you know, start slow and go low and working with folks who are, <laughs> yeah, <there it> <laughs> um, working with, working with a provider who's really able to work with them and, and help them through the process. I mm -hmm. think it's a really important part of that process so that you're not ending up at the bottom of that list with hallucinations and yes. anxiety and panic attacks. Yeah, yeah. Those those tend to be those are signs that you're definitely over medicated. Right. Um, and and actually, the the science and this is in in lab animals at least uh, is indicating that that microdosing or your smaller doses are better. They have a, a better therapeutic effect than going hog wild and and consuming a great deal of cannabis at any one time. There's, huh. Yeah, there's a point. Um, of diminishing returns in terms of, you know, you get to a, a place where you, you keep, I don't know, eating your edible or taking the oil and rubbing it on your gums, and the, the, the therapeutic effects don't, you know, they actually decrease. Yeah, so you're overloading your system and moving away from homeostasis. Exactly. <laughs> the roller coaster has gone over the hill, and it, yes. So. Not recommended. Yes. All right, so Molly has talked a couple of times about the process, and so if you are listening and you're curious about that process, I want to zip through this. Um, we recommend, I don't know if you, you know, touch on this, but we recommend that people start by talking to their primary or their specialist doctor about getting a certification. Is that Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. If people, I mean, a lot of the folks that we're seeing have a cancer diagnosis, and that's one of the qualifying mm -hmm. um, diagnoses to right. receive a medical cannabis card. Um, so definitely encouraging them that that's the that's first step to take. Mm -hmm. And I also see down the bottom of that slide, be prepared to educate. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's about approaching a doctor you're comfortable with having that conversation. Right, right. And at the end of this, um, we, we have some tools that you can take in. If you're, if you're afraid that your doctor is going to judge you or say, you know, oh, my gosh, no. I think from what we see, oncologists get it. Yeah. I think oncologists understand that, you know, this is legal in the state and, you know, but there are still some health practices that, you know, they're afraid of losing federal funding. Um, I didn't know this, but physicians' malpractice insurance is a federal uh, pool. And so some of them are afraid that if they certify patients, they will lose access to that pool. 
Um, we haven't heard of that actually happening, um, but it is a fear. It's out there. Uh, and so those patients end up needing to go to a cannabis specialist doctor, and those visits do come out of pocket, whereas talking to your primary or specialist, if you have insurance, um, you know, the certification should not cost you money. So, so I got my certification. My, my oncologist was fantastic and said, yes, absolutely, and sent me off with my cards. Um, what are my options? Now what? <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. Now what? Um, you can grow at home. I would imagine that in this population, I mean, I, we have a couple of participants in our circle that, that mention that they have tried this. It's interesting. It takes somebody with a green thumb, but it is, you know, we're, we're at that time of year, the, the harvest. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the amount of work it takes is also um, to be considered in the process. Yes. And, yeah. And what people are, what people are looking at and what they're willing to do and, you know, how close do your neighbors live, those sort of conversations. Right, right. Growing at home is, I mean, being able to produce your own medicine is so empowering, and, and I love that Maine protects that. Absolutely. Um, and it's important that even under question one, that right would be protected. But the reality is it's not, as you point out, it's, it's not for everyone. It is not for everyone. Um, and if you're, you know, if you're newly diagnosed, you don't want to have to wait, you know, here indoors a couple of months, three months before you get your first harvest. So, um you can designate a dispensary, and there are eight of them around the state. And you can, and they are listed on the, um, if you type in Maine Medical Marijuana Program, they're listed on the, the state website. Uh, and you can also designate an individual to be a, a caregiver and provide medicine for you. So, um, And we just want to point out that, you know, whether you use a caregiver or a dispensary, a uh, quality provider should give you options Absolutely. in terms of both, you know, products and potency. Um Important guidance. I mean, that's, yes. that's really a lot of what the, what folks who are coming into the cancer community center are looking for. Is right. That I want. I need someone to help guide me through this yeah. process. Right. As right. you, you know, as the months go by, it's not just a one-time right meeting that's going to exactly. cover everything. Exactly. Um, lab testing is is getting more and more common. You should be able to uh, ask them about that. Um, we all should be getting receipts, tracking our inventory, and charging. Uh, that should say collecting sales tax because technically. We're not charging. The state is, but <laughs> we have to collect it. Um, no pesticides, and, and they should make you feel safe, and 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 that your questions are are answered. So, Absolutely. yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about some resources because we're winding down. We have just a few minutes left. Um, on the left there, the Cancer Community Center. Congratulations, Molly, on the new logo. It's very sharp. Isn't it nice? I love it. It's very pretty. Um, there's the website there. Uh, what what will folks find on your website? So at cancercommunitycenter.org, people will find um, a listing of a lot of the different support services we offer, our calendar of events, so what's coming up. You can go online and sign up for our email so mm -hmm. that you'll receive weekly highlights of what's going on so you'll know when Becky's coming to visit us mm -hmm. at the Cancer Community Center. <laughs> And you'll also see all of our blog posts and um, a lot of the other information we provide, different resources um, for different cancer diagnoses, that sort of thing. Nice, nice. And you also have pictures of your staff. So. Uh, <laughs> do we? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I didn't get your permission, so I didn't add yours. But if you want to see, you know, if you want to put a face to the voice, Molly is, is on their website. Um, along with a ton of good information, I love the tagline, the place to go when you don't know where to begin. It really does feel like that. that yeah, that's for right. a lot of people, it definitely can be um, can be the place to start. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a really important resource for the community to it know is. that there is support out there when your life has been disrupted by a cancer diagnosis. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we, we appreciate the work that you do, for sure. Um, and then these other two, uh, again, the PubMed.com, that's the National Institutes of Health Clearinghouse of Cannabis, well, and all um, research, uh, scientific research published in peer-reviewed journals. And then in the center, uh, if you go to safeaccessnow.org, that is a national patient, medical cannabis patient advocacy group. Um, they lobby in D.C. to protect patients' rights and, and uh, safe access to the plant. And they produce these amazing condition-specific booklets that are free to download. 
Um, and you can find those uh, under the Publications tab on their page. And they have one specific to cancer. Uh, it's not main specific, but it's a fantastic overview. And I know you're, yeah, it's a great resource. Yeah, your folks have, have been appreciative of it when we've had those. So. So some more options for you, and if you have any remaining questions, you can always shoot us an email at info at mainwellness.org, or find us on Facebook, or tweet at us, at WellConnectMe. Uh, and thanks to producer Ben, who is a techno wizard, we are now on Instagram as well. You can find us there. So uh, thank you so much, Molly Stewart from the Cancer Community Center, for joining us today to talk a little bit about medical marijuana and cancer in Maine. Thank you so much for having me. I had a good time. I have, too. I look forward to seeing you for cooking class in, what, two weeks? November 9th. November 9th at the Cancer Community Center, Cooking with Cannabis. We'll have a good time. So all right, on behalf of uh, everyone here at WCM, I am your hostess, Becky B, and Ben G, and I are grateful for your attention today. And we're signing off. Have a good weekend. Bye.